Hey, this is Craig. If you like this show and you want to support it and you want to keep it free, head on over to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash support. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash support. If you're a business owner and you want to increase your cash flow, or if you're a label or artist and you want to promote new music, then listen up. For information about advertising on Everyone Loves Guitar, including information on geographically targeted ads, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. If you want to buy or sell a home or investment property and you're here in the Tampa Bay area, in Hillsborough, Pinellas, or Pasco counties, then listen up. West Florida Real Estate is a local residential real estate broker that's helped over 250 Bay Area homeowners buy and sell their properties in the last four years alone. If you're looking to sell, you'll want to get their free report, The 7 Biggest Mistakes Homeowners Make When Hiring a Realtor. And if you're looking to buy a property, you definitely want to get your hands on The 21 Most Expensive Mistakes Tampa Home Buyers Make When Buying a Home. Each one of these reports is going to save you time and money. Inside, you'll discover the 7 most important things to consider when hiring a realtor, what to do if you're buying and selling a home at the same time, and the danger of choosing a realtor who agrees with everything you say. To get your hands on these free reports, head on over to WestFloridaRealEstate.com. That's WestFloridaRealEstate.com. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. We have a great guitarist today, really cool guy with Corey Cherko. And he's de- Corey, you're definitely like top five hair on the history <laughs> of everyone loves guitar, man, without a doubt, for sure. So rock it. And uh, I just want to thank Todd Kearns and Jeff King for connecting us. So Corey's had a career in music for over 30 years. He's a multi-instrumentalist. This guy is off the charts, talented. He's also a music director, vocalist, mix engineer, and digital editor. He's worked with Shania Twain since 97, Kelly Clarkson. He's getting ready to go out and sub for Frank Sidoris for Slash. We had Frank on this show a while back. Uh, he also played with Jordan Smith and Reba McIntyre. His new band, Took, which also includes Slash bassist, guitarist, vocalist Todd Kearns and drummer Brent Fitz. We had Todd on the show recently. Just released their debut LP called Giver. It's great kick-ass rock. As a mix engineer and programmer, Corey's work with Mutt Lang, Mike Shipley, Nigel Green, Ron Fair, Rob Cavallo. Is it Cavallo or Cavallo? Sorry. Cavallo, yeah. Rob Cavallo, Matthew Wilder, John Fields, and Ron and Yellow. Corey, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate you coming on the show, man. Thanks for having me, Craig. It's been, it's been a while uh, that we've been trying to plan this, right? Definitely, man. <laughs> yeah, real long story behind it. And also, he's got a signature guitar. We'll talk about that with Prestige Guitar. So, um, dude, you're, as you can hear, as people can hear, you're originally from Canada. What prompted you to move to L.A. and when did you do that? Um, well, I moved to L.A. in 2001 uh, from Vancouver. And basically, I had already been on the road uh, for one tour with Shania Twain. And in that band was an Australian bass player, uh, Andy Sishon. And he had gotten his green card. And I said, dude, how do you do that? Like, he said, well, I'll give you my attorney's um, information which he did. And she, and so I contacted her just on a whim and, you know, I didn't think I would, I would get a green card, but she said, if you can do this, this, and this, and this, um, you know, I'll take you on. And I've never lost a case before. And so she basically did what she said. I got a green card. And and as soon as you get a green card, then you have to live at least six months and a day in the U S or else they can revoke it. So uh, I just, at that point, I just had to decide where I was going to go. If it's going to be New York, um, LA or Nashville. And because it was, you know, I've, I've been used to the West Coast living already. I just kind of head, headed south and I ended up in L.A. Very cool, man. And that was in 2001. What was the biggest or it, was there any big change for you once you came over, like culturally or th- something you had to get used to? Uh, well, I mean, left Vancouver, pulled off the highway in uh, off the freeway, I guess, in L.A. and Hollywood. <laughs> and, uh, in the middle of the night <laughs> and, and thought, hey we made it to hollywood and they were like oh this is hollywood and all the people <laughs> and the prostitutes and we're like it's not too late to turn around and go back home but uh, it took us a while to get settled here and and i didn't have a job or anything it was just like okay let's just throw a dart at the board and see where it lands and um we basically and we had a dog so nobody would take us with a dog so it, it took us a while to get get sorted and all i had for um 
contact here was Mike Shipley's name who uh, I'd met on the Shania tour. And he said, yeah, if you're ever in LA, give me a call. And so I, I was like, you know, I need work. I'm a Pro Tools guy, I need work. And he's a mix of really, you know, notable mix engineer. So I decided to give him a call and he said, yeah, I said, yeah, if you ever need a Pro Tools guy, just let me know. And he's like, yeah, that sounds great, man. But um, I'm good for now, uh, you know, talk to you later. And uh, he did, he called me like 30 minutes later and said, hey, can you be down here in like 10 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap, that's a good break. And he was doing a recall on an Aerosmith thing, so I was like, boom, right into it. And I ended up uh, working with him for two years after that. Just, just wow. every day in the studio. Full time in the studio. Dr. Dr. Dre on one side of the studio, and we were locked out on the other studio uh, in, in uh, Studio City at um, Record One Studios. How much weed smoke was coming from that side of the other side of the studio? I could not begin to imagine, no? That had to be pretty funky. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. I mean, all the stories that we heard about, like, you know, all the guns on the console and, and that sort of thing. And I, I had another room in the studio there where I did, yeah, I would take like the session of the day and I would work on it in another room, like replacing drum samples and all that kind of stuff, uh, timing loops and all that. And, and I, would, I would open the back door to the back alley just to get some fresh air and sunlight <laughs> in. I hated <laughs> being in the dark all the time. Yeah. And, uh, and this this big dude comes up from the back alley. He goes, "Hey, what the fuck you think you're doing? Don't you know there's that, that uh, Suge Knight just got out of jail, and you he wants to like kick Dr. Dre's ass, and and you you've just opened the door to do this. Do you want a bad man coming in here? Oh my <laughs> like, god! Oh, I just wanted some fresh air. <laughs> I, I've only been here a week from Canada. What's I'm up, man? Canada, I don't, you know. Holy yeah, he shit! Really came down to me. Wow. So you were not allowed to get fresh air anymore after that, basically? Yeah. I was like, well, okay. <laughs> holy shit. That is wild, man. But that must have been a really great education for you, like going right in the studio with Mike for two years. Oh my God, for sure. I mean, that's, I learned a, a lot about, you know, the mixing that I do now. I've learned a lot just being around it and not only just asking him questions, but also just listening to what a good mix should sound like, like yeah. all day long. Um, cause, cause you I find that you're only as good as your reference point, you know, like I had a PV banded amp as my first amp and I thought I had the best distortion in the world. Right. <laughs> but <laughs> that's because that's all I'd ever heard. Right. Sure. Yeah. That and makes, then yeah, that makes a lot gradually of you move along. And so working with Mike, I just learned what a great mix should sound like. And, uh, yeah. So it was amazing. Were you playing out at all at that time during those two years? Ah, uh, no, no. I was in between Shania records. Uh, I had moved down and like I said, I didn't know anybody else in LA. I had no connections. Um, so I was, I was just in the studio like 20, I think we took Sundays off, but even then I, I, we worked a lot of Sundays. It was, it was full on like the whole time. Did you like, how did you, were you okay with not playing for those two years? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, there's two sides to this, this business recording and playing live and i'd played live a lot up to that point so the studio was like a brand new thing that you know that i just soaked up like a sponge it was uh, amazing to be doing something different yeah to immerse myself in that and to learn as much as i could during that time but i was ready to get back on the road when when i finally did go back and and the, and the sort of the the way that i went back into to playing live was um, Mike and I got hired to uh, mix the new Shania record. So we went out to Switzerland for three months. Oh, to Mutt's studio yeah. or something like that? Yeah, to Mutt's studio. Yeah. Mutt and Shania's studio. And uh, that was like three months because there was a, a pop record and a country record. Um, it was the same vocal track, but all the music was different. So we had to basically, and there was like 18 or 19 songs on the record. Wow, times two so it was yeah. like three months every single day mixing these songs and doing the recalls at the end and then after that was all done then it was like okay now she's going to do promo and Corey, she wants you to play live on that so that's kind of how i transitioned back into the whole live thing when you say recalls can you explain what that means recalls are like um you know you you get the mix the way you want it and then you live with it 
for a few days or whatever and then you go oh you know uh we were wrong the vocal was too quiet so then you do a recall which basically is just recalling all the settings of the mix in pro tools it's easy to do now you just load up a file but at that time we were we actually were using a console we had some outboard outboard gear we were using as well um so you just got to make sure every dial is exactly where it was when okay when you did the mix originally so that it sounds the way it was and now you can boost the vocal or boost the bass guitar or whatever that's what cool. it recalled thanks man yeah you're proficient on a number of instruments i know you play fiddle you play guitar what else would you consider yourself good at musically instrument wise um well my first instrument was piano okay. uh, everybody in my family learned piano to start with when i and i started that when i was five it was like classical piano um so that was kind of the foundation for music for me was was learning classical piano and then um when i was nine uh i wanted to learn guitar um so my dad was a music teacher. I don't know if you knew that. No, I didn't. I was just, I was going to ask you that. You said everybody started on piano. So you had a musical family. Yeah. See, see my dad, my dad had a band with my mom and they, they played a lot. And then the kids came along and we all learned music because we were around it all the time. That's cool. Um, and so I was nine when I started playing guitar and I, you know, I learned like, I think Mount Bay style or whatever, you know, sure. reading, playing Hava Nagila or <laughs> whatever <laughs> I was playing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um you know and then then my dad's band my mom and dad's band broke up and at that point i was playing guitar my brother had already started playing drums and my sister had played you know continued to play the piano and flute um my mom was on bass so we we started a family band and that's that's basically how i cut my teeth that is wild so that's what you guys like did for a living your family yeah yeah at first it was just uh you know like a wedding band party band christmas party band that sort of thing um, but it, it turned, you know, when I, when I got into grade seven, um, we actually went on the road full time across Canada playing in nightclubs and wherever wow. we could. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really unusual childhood. I don't mean unusual bad. I mean, unusual. Yeah. That's yeah. It was, really and everybody would call us the Partridge family. Of course we hated that. Oh my God. Yeah. We're like, well, no, we're a band first. We're a family second. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we wanted to be wow. cool. So what, let me <laughs> ask you this. So. What was the upside and, if any, the downside of that in looking back? Well, the upside was getting to travel across Canada and see a lot of stuff that other kids never got to see. Um, got to get around a lot of other musicians because, of course, uh, we played a lot of uh, towns where there was like a rock bar across the street or something. And so we'd go across on our breaks and we get to meet all these musicians and that's you know i learned a lot about playing guitar from all these other players so that was amazing the downside um you know not really any downside except for you know the fact that i didn't get to graduate like a normal kid from grade 12 i did all my school from grade 7 through high school mm -hmm. on the road you know that's that's the only down thing but it's very small and i'm assuming you, you were probably so immersed in that lifestyle you weren't and you were having so much fun you probably never thought oh i don't have friends like in my neighborhood that probably just didn't enter your mind i would imagine yeah you know was, i was around people all the time most of them yeah. were adults of course because of the environments i, I was in yeah um, you know i had i had some friends at home that i'd hang out with when i got home and all the all the kids i i went to school with up to grade seven and i still you know would go to parties but I wasn't home that, that often, you know, once I, once I hit 12 years old, I was pretty much on the road, uh, full time. That's really amazing, man. Yeah. Wow. I one, other not... bad thing is that one other bad thing that I can think of, and this is actually probably really bad is that I had to quit playing hockey. <laughs> <laughs> if you're Canadian, yes, it's really bad. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I actually cried about that. Well, I'm sure. Yeah. That I could understand. <laughs> That's like a religion for you guys. Totally. Did you ever come across Red Volkart in your travels across? Oh, Canada? for sure. This guy's a fucking legend. What a monster player that guy is, man. He was in the, in the circuit when I was when yeah. I was playing as a kid, for sure. Yeah, because he's a little he's older than he's he's older than both of us. He's yeah, probably five, maybe ten years older than me. But I had a feeling that yeah, across and all that like chicken picking stuff. You know, I learned from guys like that on the road. And, uh, you know, it's a, big, it's a big part of my style today, actually, the hybrid. I guess they call it hybrid picking now, but we just called it chicken picking back then, you know, using, using your other fingers on your hand, on your right that's, hand. 
That is so cool. So I'm sorry. So I asked you before you, you started on, you started on piano, I, switched to guitar. What else do you play proficiently? Well, then when I got to be about 14, I got into Yngwie Malmsteen. Ah, <laughs> there you go. And he, he would always cite Paganini as an influence. I'm like, Paganini. Wow. You know, check this stuff out. I listen to the 24 caprices, whatever. And, uh, and right around that time, as fate would have it, um, my grandpa gave me a fiddle. One of his oh. fiddle. And I'm like, I'm going to learn how to play this Paganini shit. <laughs> and then I realized you really have to have some technique to do it. So instead, I just started sawing, you know, playing the Orange Blossom special and old time fiddle tunes like that. And I, I only knew like one or two songs that I would actually bring out in the set. And it was usually at the end of the night when everyone's drunk. <laughs> and they would all go nuts, you know, but I didn't, I was way more into guitar. All right. But um, I didn't realize that it was the fiddle that was going to set me up to do the things that I'm doing now because I actually got hired by Shania as a fiddle player. Really? I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. So how did she, how did she hear you playing fiddle or how did her people hear you playing fiddle? Her record company was asking around in the Canadian scenes for young, energetic sort of fiddle players. And my name came up because I played that one song in the clubs. And it was actually, Holy crap. you know how they sometimes have magazines about what's going on in your city. Like in the yeah. clubs, you'll just pick it up. It's like a free magazine. Well, there's one called country wave in Vancouver. And uh, the editor of that, um, because we had always been in that magazine, uh, she recommended me to this guy at the record company and they called me and <laughs> And I didn't, they didn't actually say it was for Shania Twain. They're looking for a fiddle player. They just said, we're looking for a fiddle player. And um, I'm kind of jumping all over my story, but I had quit music, the music business at this point. I was like burned out on playing clubs. Right. And had gotten out of music and started working as a computer animator in Vancouver. So when I got this call from Shania. Wait a minute. Just back different. up. So you were working. You had a like when did you have time to learn that in your spare time in between i mean um after i'd been playing the bars for quite a few years um the the band that i was in with my brother broke up and i didn't have any other skills so the family band was over at that point the family band broke up right as soon as i graduated from grade 12. okay um my not, because, not because you graduated from grade 12. No, no. It, my, my brother and I always wanted to, to move to Vancouver and, and start an original rock band. Okay. And my parents said, well, you can't do that until you're done your school. Okay. And so once we graduated from school, uh, you know, he had to wait, wait for me to finish as well, like two years. Uh, we, we headed for Vancouver, started a band, funded it, started an original prog rock band, funded it with a, a country cover band. Cause, cause you could, you had way less overhead Wow! And, and you just didn't need as much stuff. You could just, so we, we made our money playing country music to fund our rock project. That is so that. cool, man. Yeah. And actually that's, that's, uh, uh, the rock, the original rock band was in a, cause I know you interviewed Todd Kearns. Yeah. And, and, uh, we actually were in this competition together with different bands. So we were foes at that point. <laughs> oh, okay, because Todd was in another band. Right. That is He's wild. Like, and I was yeah. in a band called the Explorers, and we entered this Labatt's Blue Band Wars competition. It was a national competition. You know, my band actually won, won the competition and went to Japan and competed in the international one. Holy shit, man. That's awesome. Yeah, but shortly after, I mean, his band went, went on to do way more. They were way more of a success story in Canada than Age than of Electric. Are. Yeah, they're pretty big. So totally. Um, but, but right after we won that band wars competition, um, uh, what happened? Oh, the band broke up. <laughs> Wait, you and your brother's band broke up? Yes. What happened? Um, I forget the whole story. My brother will tell it differently, but essentially he moved back to Saskatchewan where we're from. Right. And I stayed in Vancouver. So it was just hard to, to yeah. have a band. Okay. In weird places. Um, so, um, and wait, what's have, the name of the town you're from? It's like a cool name. It's called Moose Jaw. Yeah. What a fucking cool name of I'm from Moose Jaw. It just sounds like you're like, it's like I'm from the Bronx. It's like saying I'm from the Bronx in Canada. That's pretty cool. That's pretty yeah. cool. I'm from Moose I mean, Jaw. Like, who's yeah, going to mess with you? You know? 
we heard we heard Moose Jaw being picked on in in like on like Happy Days and and Laverne and Shirley. <laughs> really? Yeah, it was like That's it was like cool getting name. a name called on Romper Room to hear <laughs> Laverne and Shirley saying <laughs> saying you know Moose Jaw. <laughs> yeah, they, well, you could be a pig farmer for Moose Jaw. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, they said Moose Jaw. This is so cool. <laughs> yeah. All right. Sorry, so, I mean to cut you off. I'm trying to keep track. Okay, so your your band broke up. You and your brother's band, band broke up. I had no other skills. Uh, I knew I could work in a record store because there was those things back in those days. Yeah. Or I could work in a music store, and neither of those really appealed to me. So I decided, well, I'm gonna. Oh, and, and it's, this co- coincided with my wife working at a at a drug store. Uh, she was having a seniors' day, and she said, "Hey." why don't you come down? We're having seniors day where we have coffee and donuts for the seniors. You should play some fiddle for them. I'm like, well, I only know one song. She's, and so she said, well, just learn, you know, like nine songs or whatever. So I learned exactly nine songs. And so you were uh, married very young. Yeah. I think you were too, right? Uh, yeah. Well, my first marriage. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so until like Friday will be 25 years. We're together, but yeah, you know, so I guess yeah. I was 30 or when I got married, we've been together. That's really. amazing. We're going on 27 in July. Dude, congratulations. That's awesome, man. Yeah, you were younger. So you, 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 your first marriage stuck. Yeah. Yeah, I had a little test marriage. And okay. I figured it out. <laughs> get, get, you know, get in a situation where you're happy. It's all worth it, right? It's a practice run. Oh, I'm thrilled. Yeah, man. I, was, I couldn't I have no, no complaints about that. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, congratulations. So, uh, that's nice. Yeah, so I, I, I went and played like nine songs at, at the at shoppers drug mart the drugstore in canada <laughs> and uh and then i had nine songs and no job and I'm like you know what i wonder how much money i could make playing on the streets of vancouver so i went down to uh the granville uh granville island market which is like uh, i don't know it's like your local farmer's market sure always tours there and that sort of thing and i opened my case uh, I got, I got, this is on fiddle. Sure that I wasn't going to be booted up by security, got a permit, opened my case. I started playing these nine fiddle tunes and any other ones that I was starting to learn. And I made 50 bucks in like an hour. I'm like, wow, if I stay here another hour and make the same money, I've already made as much as I, that, that I would make in a bar, you know, for a night. Um, and you know, it was, it was a very low point in my life because I, I thought I was begging for money. But after I started meeting a lot of other musicians who were doing it, I realized it was a real art form, you know, like people playing Chinese violin, like how is that guy supposed to have a job anywhere else but playing, you know, on the streets yeah. or heart players, you know, sure. uh, and I met a lot of missing musicians that way. And I started, started to actually feel confident that I was, you know, doing a good thing and I was entertaining people. I wasn't. I wasn't getting my microphone stand knocked into my teeth by a drunk guy who was asking for, for us to play "Sweet Home Alabama" again. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a plus. And your wife is super supportive of this. I'm assuming. Oh yeah, for sure. That's really good, man. That's the number one. Um, people often ask you, "What is the number one thing successful players have in common?" And and that's it: support from loved ones either, you know parents when you're younger and spouses partners whatever yeah by far that's the number one thing i mean i've had yeah, absolutely and i have to say that one of the rockiest times in our marriage was when i was an animator because she said i met you as a an entertainer and now all i all i see is the back of your head at the computer you know that's so really cool he was supportive of me getting back into it for sure yeah that's so important man i think that having support in general is like an incredibly important, I think it changes your whole dynamics of your personality. If you grow up with it versus without it, even, you know, Yeah, for sure. So, wow. That's really cool. Yeah. So um, and anyway, it was because of playing on the streets of Vancouver, playing fiddle uh, that I was ready for the call to do Shania when it came, you know, as a fiddle player, because otherwise I would have just been a, a guitar player who said, well, I only know one fiddle song, so I'm going to have to pass. <laughs> Crazy how shit like that works out, right? Like, yeah. who That's actually thought, you know? Stopped. Totally. Yeah. I stopped believing in um, being able to control your, your life or your destiny. Oh, yeah, that's a good, um, good laugh. Yeah, I, I'm a complete <laughs> believer in fate because of that. Yeah. Because up to that point, 
you know, we had done everything to make our band successful. We had great personnel. Uh, we had we had talented musicians. Uh, we worked hard. We weren't partiers. You know, just everything that you could think a good work ethic a good work ethic would deserve. Right. And it didn't happen for us. And it took me quitting music altogether for me to get my musical break, you know, that I, you know, to where I am now. It's so strange. Yeah. It's, and that's what I love about doing these interviews because I hear these stories and it always, um, you know, it reminds me to keep trusting the universe, to be honest yeah. with you, because if you, I believe if you surrendered to that, and expect positive, then you'll get it more likely than if you try to like wrestle it and control it, to be honest with you. Yeah, exactly. It just gets you in a funk when things don't work out for you. But if you learn to just accept it and go, okay, well, you know, maybe there's another door that I'm supposed to go through somewhere down the line. Right. Yeah. Because then, if you, then you can I'm feel, sorry. You, sorry, then you can feel really good about um, when things don't happen, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's if you sit, I know myself, if you get into the why me, there's no upside to that, man. It's, you feel like a victim. It's just awful, man. You know, yeah, for sure. it, it, it's, it's much, it's a struggle to say, okay, well, this is meant to be, I don't know the answer yet, but I think that's just ultimately the easier way, man. That's really cool. I'm so happy how things worked out. And was it, this is a silly question, but isn't it cold up there to be in asking in the winter? Like, um, yeah. Well, Vancouver is the only place where it really doesn't freeze. Okay. Like in, in that side of the world, it's it's like Seattle. Okay. You'll get snow maybe a couple of times a year, but it just it's just wet and it dissolves because it rains right afterwards. Okay. Um, so yeah, it got pretty cold um, in the winter times. See, it became a science where the spots were to actually make money. Um, and right. one of the spots for me was at the C bus terminal. The C bus was a little boat that you took took you from downtown Vancouver to North Vancouver, and people would come. They'd wait for the boat to come and I would have a captive audience. So it wasn't like they were walking by me like okay. in other busking situations. So I could entertain them for maybe two or three songs. Um, and I put on a show, you know, a lot of guys, when they busk, they just kind of stare down at the feet and sing, you know, Neil Young songs. And, um, <laughs> and I actually had like, uh, I did, <laughs> I did MIDI tracks on my, uh, my little keyboard that I won in the band wars competition. Right. So with these MIDI drums and, uh, and I would I would play to these backing tracks and and I would sing and I would play fiddle, and uh, and then I'd play guitar sometimes. I'd bring my guitar once in a while, but you know it was it was a young guy playing fiddle with a boombox behind me that was sort yeah. of you know people would go oh this is kind of interesting and you know then I would then the the doors would open people would get in the boat and as they walk by they they give me the money. <laughs> and it was totally you had a permit you said that was you, yeah exactly yeah. I became friends with the the employees at the C bus terminals and they were they were always happy to ha have me there and so it's so it worked cool, out really well it's smart but, that you picked the gods on me on the beach yeah uh, so, that so that was that. That that's was what you were doing summer. yeah i was actually playing on the beach and people were sitting on the grass uh on the other side of the sand and uh that's where todd <laughs> saw me <laughs> did he come over to you that day uh i think so yeah i think so and then he sat and listened for a bit and it was always a little embarrassing for me because, you know, he was in Age of Electric and uh, and here I was, you know, playing for Spare Change. So it was, uh, you know, but but the greater picture at that time for me was, well, I'm putting myself through computer animation school. Right. So this is all a means to an end, you know. Plus, you might have been making more money than he was in Age of Electric. You just don't know, man. Who knows, yeah. It's great, man. What a good story, man. That was really, thanks for sharing that. That was very cool. No problem. Uh, so you're a band member of Took, and you can talk about because uh, Todd and Brent are in that, and you're one of the founders. What's the pluses and minuses of running your own band versus being a sideman? <laughs> <laughs> well, when you're sideman, you, <laughs> you learn the songs, and you rehearse them, and then you play the shows, and then you have fun. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you don't have to worry about anything, any promotion, any social media. It's just, uh, you know, wh when you have your own band, it's a business. You got to worry about merchandise. You got to worry about when to release the next single, what the artwork is going to be for that single. You got to think about gigs. How are we going to organize hotels? How are we not going to go in the hole when we do the gigs? And, you know, th the good thing about Tuke is that we can split it amongst the members of the band, you know, 
Brent Fitz, the drummer from Slash, he does a lot of the, um, you know, the booking the flights along with our manager because we have a manager in Vancouver. And, you know, so we all try to take on what we can. Um, but, what you know, you it's still, it's, what's that? What do you, like, what role do you like? What, what stuff do you like that you tend to do? Well, I'm the guy, I'm the guy at the studio, first of all. So I, I usually start all the, recording all the songs and okay. get, get all the band tracks down and, you know, record the, or program the fake drum track and then, you know, flesh out the song. And then when I'm done that, I'll, uh, I'll pass it on to Shane, who's the drummer for the band. He has his own studio as well. And he'll take the tracks I've done and record the drums to it. Um, so I, I do all the mixing, the recording. Wait a minute, uh, aside Brent, from, I thought Brent was the drummer. <laughs> well, he was on the first record. But he, he see, he, he, the guy's got perfect pitch. For him just to play drums, it, you know, it's a shame because he also knows how to play bass. He knows how to play keyboards. Oh, uh, so you haven't. Wanted, okay. Yeah, he wanted to come out front and actually be the bass player. So now Fitz is, Brent is the bass player. Uh, and Shane, another guy from Canada, is the drummer. And you and Todd are, co are, are playing guitar, lead and rhythm, or are you switching off? Or yeah, we, we switch off. I, you know, I play most of the leads because he's busy singing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's songs wow. where we'll, we'll trade off solos and that sort of thing. I mean, everybody, we, we have such a respect for everybody in the band. Uh, it's, it's just so much fun. And the reason we do it is because um, it's exactly what we got into music for yeah. in the first place, you know, to have fun, play rock and roll and uh have a laugh you know that's so cool that's what Tuke is but uh yeah so you know as as, as hardy as the as the the business is the side of it is it's it's still a lot of fun and i don't think we would do it if it wasn't because we're not getting rich from it we just do it to celebrate sure music that we cut our teeth on and for people that don't know to plays canadian cover tunes from the 70s and 80s but we have an original song on the new record, which is coming out in August. Uh, so we're really excited about that. We shot a video and it's ready to go. We just can't wait to, uh, to show it to the world. What's the name of the song? Can you say? Or not? Um, hmm. Can I say? I think I can say. It's called Never Enough. Never Enough for You. It is a bit of a surprise, though. But, you know, people know it's coming. So That's really cool, man. Yeah. Now you said the new record's coming out in August. That's another one after Giver. That's right. So that's and, and the album is called Never Enough as well. Oh, that's cool. So you got the oh, that's really nice, man. Yeah. So you're cranking out albums now pretty quick. Um, it's I mean, pe people wouldn't say that our fans because because we've we've been teasing them with a bunch a sequence of, of singles. The album's actually been done since last year about this time. Um, but okay, because we we're always on different schedules. Yeah. Like yeah. Shania, uh, Shane was playing with super group bees in Japan. He was always over oh, there. Sure. Oh, Shane Gallus. Yeah. Yeah. You know I, know, I don't No, I don't, I know him. I've interviewed a ton of people. No, I want to meet him actually, but I've interviewed a ton of people that have played with him and every guitar player I've interviewed is like, you know, yeah, that guy is the man. He's incredible. Yeah. And I, I, you should have him on the show because... Well, I want to... Yeah, uh, I'd love to meet him. Yeah, man. He's actually a really awesome guitar player as well. <laughs> it's so funny. I Like 10% yeah. of my guests are non-guitar, but like, like, um, what's his name? Who did I interview oh, not that long ago that played a, spent a lot of time with him? Jeff Coleman. Oh, yeah, Jeff. Yeah, exactly. And those guys played a lot. And his last awesome. name is like the coolest. It's like G-A-A-L... <laughs> A A S S or something like yeah, that, right? It's so uh, it's so Viking. Yeah, I was like, how do you pronounce it? He goes Gallus. I'm like, oh wow, yeah. yeah that, I know that guy. I know who he is, man. That's so funny. It was a pretty small world. With yeah, he played with Ingvi Malmsteen as well, and uh, that's uh, right. Michael Schenker. I think he played with yep. Michael Schenker. Yep. And that's how he, that's how he met Jeff because they were with MSG yeah. together. And when Jeff came out to California, I think he lived with Shane. If this is the story, I yeah, think. you're right. Yeah. Yeah. That's wow, man. What a small world. It's a small world. Holy shit. Okay. So go ahead now. So, okay. So you, so you're coming out with this record in August. That's awesome. Man. Dude, when you come out with the record, come back on the show, we'll do like a 30 minute show to promote it. That'd be awesome. Yeah, man. In fact, that would be good. Like if two, if you're all like near each other, 
like have two or three of you on in the same well, we're planning a tour. So the reason why we're putting the album out in August is because we're actually all have holes in our schedule then to actually play some shows to, to release the CD. This is awesome. So we're, yeah, we're what are some, you know, that'd be kind of fun. Yeah, man. All together. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. We're, so where yeah. are you touring? Where, what places are you touring? Uh, we're going to Regina, Calgary and Winnipeg, I think, but we haven't solidified the Winnipeg dates yet. That's, are you doing any U S tours are only up in Canada? So far, you know, our audience is primarily in, in Canada because Got of all the, you know, the genre, the Canadian tunes. Oh, yeah. Uh, it'd be hard to like. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, we could do lots of shows in the States, but we wouldn't draw as, as much. So it would, yeah, uh, it would be paid, a little harder going, I think. Yeah. And like exactly. you said, it's not like you're making a fortune. If, you know, if anything exactly. off this anyway, you don't want to go out and like in knowingly lose money every gig. Is, we would be yeah. paying for, you know, to play those shows. No, that's sure. not cool, man. This is music yeah. is. It, you know, the joy of it is great, but it, it becomes a drag if you're not at least breaking even or getting a couple of bucks yeah. in your pocket. Yeah, I totally, totally. That, man. totally. Um, okay, so I'm going to throw out some artists' names that you've worked with. Talk about how you got the gig, Corey, and some cool yeah. uh, and a cool or interesting story about working with them. I, you talked about how you got the gig with Shania. Is, tell me a cool or interesting story about working with her or with Mutt. Um, so, so Mutt, you know, was married to Shania at that point mm. when, when I came on and, um, so let's see, how did, how did it transpire? I was working as an animator in a cubicle on a, on a Transformers television show, a syndicated, syndicated television show. Good show. Um, the call came out of nowhere. We talked about the call from the record company. I, I didn't call back immediately. Because you weren't was, sure if you were going to be in the stay in the music business. Yeah, I was, I was in a new career and I loved it. Yeah. I loved being an animator. I loved, I loved computers. I loved Oh, and that's where the convo with your wife come in. You went home and said, yes. honey, I got this call. And yes. she's the one who said, psh, psh, what are you doing? Of course, return the fucking call. Exactly. Well, we didn't know it was for Shania. So we, we just thought it was a Canadian artist that was, you know, that they were developing. And so I, I in the back of my mind, I thought, well, I'm, I'm just going to be getting back into something I just got out of, you know, playing for $400 a week, whatever. So it's not that I didn't want to call back. It's just that I kind of forgot about it. Right. right. But it was like three days later and the record company called back again and left another message saying, look, we were a little discreet about who it was for, but it's for Shania Twain. So you should really give us a call <laughs> big time at that point. I remember actually, you know, sitting around with Todd when uh, <laughs> back in those days, even before I got this call, I was listening to a Shania Twain record talking about, you know, oh, this is Shania and Mutt Lang produced it and isn't it awesome and all this. And so it's kind of funny that, that, uh, that I was, you know, all this happened before I yeah. got this call. So automatically, you know, I called right back. And I think it was like at night. So in Toronto time, it was way later. Mm -hmm. But I left the message saying, yeah, I'm very interested. Uh, I'd like to talk more about this. So they called back. And they asked me for a C, a, 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 a picture. Uh, and so I sent that away and went back to work. Didn't think any more about it. Got a call maybe a week later from the tour manager who said, you know, uh, Shania and Mutt liked your package. And we would like to have you come play the David Letterman show with her. Holy <laughs> as, crap. As your audition. Baptism by fire, man. Yes. There you go. So I was literally working in a cubicle in Vancouver, downtown Vancouver. The next <laughs> night I was, I was in Times Square. That's so cool. Up in a hotel right in the center of Times Square. And I was like, what is going on? This is crazy. Um, and your wife is probably ecstatic for you, right? Like that this oh, is all going on, right? Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, I played the show, went well. They told me not to quit my day job, that she was going to go through all, all the musicians and decide who she wants to take on tour. At that point, I didn't care. I just played the David Letterman show. <laughs> it was kind of like, this, this caps off my, my musical career that I'm now out of, you know, with something that I can say, well, at least I played the David Letterman show. Sure. You know, I could have died at that point. It, it would have been fun. That's so cool. I went back, back to work. Um, and was, then was I that, got the call. Was, was that, that sorry? Was that your first time in this, in New York City? Oh yeah, 
Oh yeah. Oh, so you were like all lit up, man. It was crazy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I didn't know what was going on. You know, I couldn't sleep at night. You know, I was excited for the gig, but also there was just so many sirens and honk. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, yeah. Because I was right in Times Square. <laughs> yeah, and his theater it used to be like on Broadway, just like maybe on Seventh Avenue, I think, or Broadway, like five or six yeah. blocks north of that. Totally. Yeah, I know exactly where that is. That's cool. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it was it was amazing. It, that was really cold to play that gig, by the way. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever told you about playing David Letterman, but, but it's like 50 degrees in the studio. Jeff King, in fact, told me about it. He said it's ice cold there, man. And he, but he said yeah. it's intentional. They do it like what? What is there? I forgot the reason. Well, I mean, I heard it was because he didn't want his makeup running from sweat, you know, and sweating. Mm. No, I don't know no. if that's true or not. Yeah, I don't, but I, I, I think it was it was because of Dave being hot, you know. Wow. Yeah, that's. Yeah. I, I've spoke to a few people. And they said, "Shit, that's freezing on there." Yeah, that's. Exactly. Yeah, but can you imagine being Paul Schaefer in the band and and you know because your fingers don't work right when it's that yeah. cold. So you really have to warm up, you know, in the dressing room and come out warm. That's so cool, man. Yeah. So they so called I, you a few days later after that. Yeah. So no, it was probably like almost two weeks after that, and the tour manager called back. He said, "Well, you made it to the next rung of the ladder. You never said you, you got the gig." He, mm. He never, ever said you got the gig. He just said, well, you've made it to the next rung of the ladder. Think of this as a ladder, he said. You made it to the next rung of the ladder. And now we want to get you out to their compound in upstate New York, and uh, you're going to start rehearsing for the tour. Well, we, were, we rehearsed, and, re and they, but he said, once again, don't quit your day job. But because I was working in a high-tech industry um, who have very guarded secrets, they wouldn't give me a leave of absence. They, they pretty much said, if you go, you know, you lose your job basically. And, you know, oh, we don't want man. to fix about it, but it's just, you know, we have proprietary software. We don't want secrets getting out and all that kind of stuff. So I was, I had, I had quit my day job, went to upstate New York and we rehearsed for, for about three months. I didn't think I'd ever get to see a show. We were rehearsing vocals. Like we, I mean, everything was so meticulous. And this is, this is when I learned, you know, when, cause Mutt was the music director of the band. So he would sit there and make us run it over and over. And he would say to me things like, you know, Corey, if you would just play everything 10 milliseconds later, <laughs> we'll be right in the pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Basically when I learned how, how crappy I was, you know, as a musician, but it was okay because I was getting paid, for, you know, to be there. And I was basically being paid to go to school. Yeah, which is wonderful. Where, where was this? Is this in Bearsville by any chance? Uh, Lake Placid area. Oh, that's way the hell. That's like near yeah, Canada. Canada. Yeah. In fact, I flew into Montreal and they, they taxied me over. Yeah. Over the border. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, yeah. So, so Mutt was there for all of it. And we just, to the nth degree, we learned these parts. We learned, you know, he would tell us like, you know, to get these BVs just right, you have to have the same vocal, the, the, the same throat shape. That's what makes the Eagles such a great band is that they're always singing with the same throat shape. You know, we say stuff like that and, and things you wouldn't really think about. Well, I, I was singing in tune, wasn't I? Isn't that what you wanted? <laughs> yeah. But it was much more than that. It was all those kinds of things that, that uh, such an amazing experience. And, and then the day finally came, we, we started the tour and, we did a full like two years of, of that record, the Come On Over record. Um, then I'll get on to the next part, how I got onto with Kelly Clarkson because- Hold on one second, the, did they ever officially tell you you're in the band or they just started paying you know, checks and you just sort of like made yeah, a safe I just played the gig and I figured I was in the band at that yeah. point. <laughs> Go for, you know, I hear that a lot. And it's like, man, you, you gotta give a guy closure, especially someone like, it was bad enough that they said, don't leave your day job, come up here for three months. Like how the fuck, who's gonna work that out? Yeah. You know, um, that was really cool, man. Yeah, I figured, you know, it was worth taking the gamble because I could always get back in animation. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, Things definitely to, to play with Mutt and Shania. Hell yeah. Oh, yeah. Come on, right? Okay, uh, everybody. So yeah. So then we we played a, played a tour, uh, came back, and that's when I moved to L.A. to work with Mike Shepley for those two years. Great. Um, after after that was over, we did a tour and uh, for another year and a half, I think it was a shorter tour 
for the op record. And then I ended up in LA again. I'm like, crap, now that tour's over and I'm back in LA and I, I still don't have any other skills but what I was doing. I don't know anyone else in LA. Well, hold I started on a second. Get, At that point though, you had some great skills because you had, you had three and a half years on the road with a well-oiled machine and then two years in the studio. So you, I, I would beg to dare. I mean, you had some. Right. Mike Shifley had moved on to another guy yeah. to replace me. Right. So, you know, I wasn't able to get back in there. Okay. Um, basically, when I say I didn't know anyone, I, I only knew people in the Shania camp, in the gotcha. Shania world. Gotcha. And so when I got back and, and all Shania things had ceased, ceased mm -hmm. then I was, I was back in the same boat. I didn't know who to call or what to do. I, I, you know, I, I called, you know, Shania's manager. I said it, you know, because they also managed Bruce Springsteen. I'm like, uh, actually, at that time, it was... Um, Q Prime, which was Metallica. Right after the second Shania tour, sure. I had nothing, nothing planned. I had no gigs. I had a house that I'd bought that was, and all my savings were being used up by that really, really quickly. I was burning sure. through money. Um, so it didn't look like I was going to get a gig anywhere. So I decided to try to get back into animation again. So I, I applied at EA, um, EA Sports or something in. Uh, Venice Beach area. Hmm. And then I also applied at line six. Okay. Be like a, a product manager or something like that. I thought maybe my music career is over and now I'll just get into, uh, you know, retail side of things. But really it was a function of you didn't know anybody. Right. So it's like, which in this industry, you know, I don't consider myself in the music industry, but my under my working with the music industry for the last almost two years. In fact, I was just telling my wife last night, it is all about this guy refers you to that guy. This woman refers you to that guy. Yeah. hundred percent. Like with rare exception. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just didn't have a big enough network in the States yet. Yeah. So I was panicking and I, I got a resume and I applied at line six as a product manager and what the guy that I applied to actually was a Canadian. So we sort of vibed a bit. He's like, Oh, I used to live in Vancouver too. Oh, cool. We, you know, just uh, reminisced about the old days in, in Vancouver. Quick question for you. How long did it take you to apply for that job? Uh, six months. I was at a six month period. Yeah. Not okay. Gig and I was like, man, we're, we're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, cause I give you credit. Cause that's, you know, you're coming. I know the lifestyle that you're living when you're coming off a Shania Twain, Mutt Lang, second world tour. And some people might have had ego issues with doing that. So I give you a lot of credit. Yeah, no, I, I know what you mean, too. And I know people and it's probably because I know people that do it as have done it as well. Like great musicians who are are internationally known and they're working at a grocery store because, just because they have to do something you got to make money you gotta eat yeah exactly um do you know bill champlin you ever heard that name bill champlin uh no he was in chicago the, the band chicago for uh almost 30 years and he he's a solo artist he had a really successful band in the 60s called sons of champlin which was really great anyway i interviewed him he goes he was talking about a similar thing he had to do something he goes well you know what they say craig all god's children gotta pay rent <laughs> Which I thought, and he's like, just he's an, a little bit older guy. So when he says something, it like he's got this Yoda wisdom thing. <laughs> it was so funny when he said that. Yeah. Sorry, man. I'm through. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So line uh, six, you and the Canadian. Yeah, and I applied. Uh, I heard back from him a couple of days later and said, uh, "Look, we didn't get the gig, or you didn't get the gig, um, but." Kelly Clarkson's guitar player was just in here. And he said that Kelly wants two violinists for her next tour. And he asked me if I knew any fiddle players. And because we had just talked, I recommended you. And uh, he said, I hope that was okay. And I said, yeah, of course. Yeah, twist my arm. <laughs> and um, so Is he just playing fiddle for Kelly or playing fiddle uh, uh, where they launched the sea boat back in Vancouver. <laughs> so that's, I'll go for option a first. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, so then I, I got a call from her music director 
and I went on the road. That's how I got the gig with Kelly. So, as a violinist, once again, me being a, a guitar player primarily. Crazy, man. Getting all these gigs with violin. You know, and now, now that, that I've been in the industry a lot longer, I know that obviously, you know, dobro players, fiddle players, steel guitar players, they're novelty instruments. Not as many people, you know, fit the bill for, for gigs. Yeah. Um, so that's why I've gotten all these g big gigs playing, playing the fiddle, but always considering myself a guitar player. <laughs> so was that Aben? Who was her? Was uh, Aben wasn't in the band at that point. Okay. Aben, did you do I interviewed Aben. He's a great guy. Yeah. He's yeah. really, he's funny as hell. Yeah. No, he, I did the first tour. Aben was on the first tour, but he was in the opening band. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So he, he was there as long as I was but he was there for the first tour as in the opening band. Cause he's I, been with her a long time now, I think. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll really, oh. uh, yeah. So did that tour and, and, and here's, here's the funny story is at the end of that first Kelly tour, cause I would only play five songs in the whole show. And then I'd spend the rest of the night just watching from the wings. Hmm. On the stage. So I knew, I knew the whole show and, and the arrangement of the show. Um, and, and the guitar player at the time, actually the same guitar player that kind of got me the gig from, who was in at line six, uh, was about to get fired. Or he did, oh, get, wow. he did get fired. But there's only one show left. So it wasn't like they're going to hold auditions for a bunch of guitar players for one show. Music director came to me once again, Jason Halbert, and he said, do you, do you think you can play guitar on the last show? And I'm like, hell yeah. Awesome. So, so you got, that's your Hail Mary pass, man. Last game, last season. Yep. Last game of the season, rather. That's so cool. Yep. And it was in Vancouver, so it was my hometown. Oh, so, man. I that did. must have made you feel like, like everything's lining up there to say this is, yeah. Totally. That's great. And the show went well. Uh, Kelly came up to me after. She goes, I'm going to call you Turbo from now on. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool, man. Yeah. And then it sort of built from there. The next tour after that, I was a utility guy with Kelly and then the next tour after that I was uh, in a, you know one of the major guitar player roles along with Aben. That is so cool. Yeah. What a great story, man. Now, let's talk about uh Reba. Is that how you know Jeff? That's how I know Jeff. Okay. So, one of the tours I did with Kelly was uh a, a double header. Right. They would all right. World's two voices and all, the whole band was on, both bands, Reba's band and Kelly's band were on stage at the same time for this show. You know, except the drummers. It was kind of weird having two drummers for the whole thing and two bass players. So they would go sit, sit off. But other than that, the whole band was on there. And I would play fiddle for Reba and guitar. And, and they would sing each other's songs. So it wasn't like Kelly played all her show and then Reba played all her show. We, it was very much uh, intermingled, you know. Uh, so that's kind of how I, I met Jeff King and the whole Reba camp. After that tour was over, I said to Reba's musical director, you know, I, I didn't really have anything lined up after this. If Reba needs somebody, I'd love to play with you guys. He says, actually, we do. And so I, I did like nine months with Reba as one of her utility players, playing fiddle, mando, acoustic guitar, singing backups, you know, just whatever I could do to be valuable. So at that point in time, you – did you know that guy well or you just said, hey – I know now I need to be more aggressive and to, to let people know I need stuff. I'm, I'm open to opportunities. Which one? Um, I A mean, both maybe the hustle is the worst thing about this gig is after you're done a tour, you know, you have to yeah. find something else and you know, it's kind of like your tails between your legs and you're like, uh, I don't have anything going on right now. So, uh, you know, hire me. <laughs> essentially is what you're saying yeah but every every musician goes through it so. uh, yeah i don't think it's an awkward thing for the people here in that i think everybody's like totally i mean you'd have to be a real bastard i mean a real bastard to in any way shape or form have any sort of condescending or douchey reception right. to that especially someone like that's a top performer right you know and you're saying hey i have i mean you're being honest. Hey, I have I like if you have anything, I'd like love to ha you know check it out. You know what? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that's pretty normal. Yeah. So, um, what was your question? I forget what it was. Uh, like, so I guess you. I, my question was: So you, 
it was a combination of the two, like, hey, I know I need to go ask for this. I know I need to be more proactive. D- did you know him really well, or, or was this just like your just moxie, which I give you credit for? Are you talking the music director? For yeah. Me? Yeah. Yeah. We, we all shared a dressing room together. On uh, okay. So it was easy. We were good friends with everybody that, you know, that, okay. You know, that's, I could tell you stories about Jeff King and Franks that we, dude, he's so, <laughs> we, 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 we saw Reba here and he, and so he, my wife's like a big Reba fan. So he gives us like VIP tickets and we're standing online and I'm talking to Ann and I'm not big. I'm five, nine. And, and my wife's like five, three. And she's like looking at me and I'm like, like looking over my shoulder and I'm like, you know, like some weird dude, like I could just get a vibe. So I said, <laughs> Jeff King, had been, you know, he's like six, two or something. He had been walking along with us the whole time, like listening to our, like standing right next to me. And all of a sudden, Ann's like this creepy dude. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, it's very, Jeff. and then we hung out, at, you know, he, he did some more Jeff stuff that I can't really say on the air, but it was, we had a great night. He was quite funny. <laughs> he's so funny. The guy has no ego at all. He's very, Oh, he's secure and is, I mean, he's such a great player. I mean, it's hard for him to, to feel like threatened by anybody. So, yeah. Um, you know, I learned a lot from those guys. And of course, Bruce Bouton was in, um, I interviewed Bruce too. Great steel player, man. Yeah. He was in the band and, and wow. you know, he's the steel guitar player on one of my favorite albums. In fact, uh, you asked ahead of time what, you know, what my desert Island record. Yeah. Was. One of them is, is the album that, Bruce played on with Ricky Skaggs, Highways and Heartaches. Uh, you know, that, that album was legendary up in Canada. Every band would play at least three or four tracks from that album in their repertoire. And, and they're always like, you know, to show off your skills <laughs> as, a, as a country player. That, that, that's what that album was all about. Yeah. He had songs like uh, Heartbroken Stuff, which were big radio hits, but there's some deep cuts like... Uh, high, um, not Highway 40 Blues, but uh, I mean, that one too, obviously. Uh, can't think of the name of the song, but it was the big jam song that every band would play and, and extend for like 10 minutes showing off your chicken picking skills, you know? Yeah, Bruce is a great player, very good reputation yeah. in, in Nashville. It's great to hear all those stories from that. And really, I've just been blessed with being around really cool people, you know, since I started playing music. Jeff's also a really good person. I'm, when I did his interview, he got... Uh, pretty serious at, at times he's really got pretty deep and yeah and then i, I had when I, I think uh i was up in nashville shortly after that so i went over actually to his house and met his wife and then we grabbed some dinner or something like that he's just a really sweet guy you know his family's very nice so did you actually do any work with mutt or did you get to do any stuff with him or yeah so um i don't know if you know who my brother is kevin Churko. He's, no, I know that you, I, I've read, I've, I think I read his name when I was doing research on you. Right. So after the first Shania tour, she, she came to me and she said, you know what? Mutt needs a guy in the studio. I don't know if you're <coughs> interested in it, but, um, you know, we'd love to have you if you would like to, to work with Mutt. I'm like, you know, this is a chance of a lifetime, but up until that point, I'd only known how to use like, like kick block on my computer. Right. So uh, I didn't know Pro Tools. So I said, I wouldn't want to waste much time because I'm not really up to speed on Pro Tools at this point. But my brother has been doing it for the last five years and he would be perfect for, you know, to work with Mutt. So they flew him over and um, got along famously with Mutt. And so he got the gig and he actually moved his whole family over to Switzerland for two years. Wow. What a cool opportunity. Totally. And in that time, I was off from tour. Um, I sort of put it to them, like, because I wanted to learn about Pro Tools myself. I said, you know, what would be great is if I came to, to Switzerland as well and, and we could tag team Kevin and I could do twice the amount of work, um, you know, on this stuff. So they, they actually flew me over as well. And I learned from my brother how to do this stuff. And I was tuning vocals for, you know, uh, all the stuff that Mutt was doing outside of Shania, like Celine Dion and Britney Spears and the Coors. Uh, so I worked with him on that while, you know, alongside my brother, you know, show, showing me how to do stuff. I already do, had done a little bit, but that's kind of where I, I cut most of my teeth, uh, you know, learning Pro Tools was in that time period. And then, of course, when I, after the 
uh, after that point, I came back to LA and I was working with Mike, Ship or Mike Shipley for two years. You know, obviously my Pro Tools skills got a lot better mm. at that point. Then we went to mix the Shania Op record and I did three months working with Mutt at that point. So I, I've always kind of been back and forth working with Mutt and then, you know, just working with him in the capacity as a, as a, a live musician as well and learning about timing, like I said, you know. So, yeah, I, I did, I did, you know, quite a bit of time with Mutt as well. That's great. It's, it's interesting. I had Phil Collin from Def Leppard on and we had a, he had very similar things to say about Mutt. He said, you know, of course he made that hysteria record, but he said, he would tell them to do what on the surface appeared like strange or just very unconventional things. Yeah. Like what you said, everybody had the same shape void. Like who thinks who's thinking about that. Right. But he said that he, his thought, he's just like a genius. He said his thought process is just not, he, he doesn't see things from the same filters that most people look at. It, and as a result, he gets these results that most people don't get, you know, but it was very similar experience. He works very intensely. Uh, he's always a, he's always a nice guy, but he expects a lot from you when you work with him mm. because he has the same work ethic for himself. Sure. I'm doing it. Well, everybody should be able to do it, right? Yeah. Um, so it was really, really intense um, working with him. Uh, I probably wouldn't want to do it again, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. Yeah, I totally get that. That's a really fair statement. Um, because it was very exhausting. Uh, you know, I was working Pro Tools. He would say, uh, you know, he'd be sitting behind me on the couch and he, he would be his instrument basically, you know, do this, do that, do that. Uh, and, and you'd have to be listening so intently the whole time because, you know, the music's playing and he's saying, turn that up. And you have to know whether he said, turn that up or that's too much up, you know? So you had to yeah. listen to every detail of what he said because you'd do the wrong thing if you didn't. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, was, was your wife there with you or you just flew a solo? She was, she was, she came for a little bit of it. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, she probably came for like a third of the time I was there. Oh, so. that's okay. That's good. Yeah. It was good. Yeah. Um, do you have any other side hustles going now? I mean, you have side, you have, you know, two, you have your side man stuff. Any other side hustles, like maybe even that are, to me, what I consider a side hustle is making money in or out of music, but other than standing and playing. Right. Um, right now, Tuke is my main thing. Uh, I do have, and I have had plans for a while. Um, whenever I go somewhere exotic, I record nature sounds wherever I am. That's very and, cool. And, it, and why, you might ask? Well, because uh, in a world that is so stressed out, uh, I, I want to make an app without giving too much, without giving my idea away. <laughs> I don't know if I'll ever do it, but I would like to do it. Um, I would like to make an app where you can um, listen to nature sounds and mix in your own music. So you pick a nature sound from somewhere in the world. Uh, let's say, cause I, I've done, I've been in Africa, I've been in you know, Hawaii, I've been to Southeast Asia and I record everywhere I go. I've been up to Canada and sometimes it's just a matter of putting your recorder by a babbling brook and that's enough to you know take the edge off if someone listens to that and you can listen to it by itself or you could put your own music to it because everybody has different tastes in music and you know a lot of those meditation cds that you hear with the whale sounds have really cheesy midi program music yeah, yeah. that is completely destroys the experience for you so oh man it's so it really i remember i was in a getting a massage one time and they put this stuff on and i was like oh i start relaxing then i hear like midi shit i'm like oh it's been on some something that's supposed to sound like a kodo or something <laughs> and i mean like the average person that's not really into music isn't gonna pay attention but it was like nails on a chalkboard you know exactly so so my app would have pick pick a sound from anywhere in the world pick your own music that you want to go with it and uh and and use it doing yoga use it in meditation use it um on a plane when you're if you're scared of flying any yeah put it in hotel lobbies you know anything like that and you know just just to try and, and ease the uh, stress of the world i think that's a really good idea yeah i do just gotta get around to to making it happen you know? yeah well i mean i know it's, it's tough to get everything done that's a good idea though man thanks um Low points. You talked about that one period 
where you quit wound up quitting music any other low points or dark periods you've had to deal with and how'd you get through them i think i think that you know like i said applying for jobs having to abandon music originally was a low point and then and then playing on the streets for spare change when i thought i was like i'd worked so hard at my craft and and then having to rely on playing for spare change i, I just thought it was a very very low point in my life um but you know looking back on it it was preparing me for for these gigs it's that amazing isn't it yeah so are you that, you wouldn't be where you are today had you not done that totally. that is totally crazy man totally crazy well, like i said and that's that's when i stopped trying to control my life you know obviously you have to make decisions and you have to act like you have free will but ultimately we I don't think we really have free will. It's just, you're, you're just reacting to what has happened to you since the start of your life. You know, and everybody else is doing the same thing and, and you know, has not in, intertwined and, and you end up with a, a great opportunity. And it is what it is when it happens and you, you just open that door and walk through it. But if the door's locked, don't, don't bang your head against it and become bitter. There you go, man. That's the whole key. Do you know who James Lomenzo is, bass player? No. He said he was a top bass player in like uh, great white, not oh. great white, sorry, white lion um, played with Zach wild and black label society. A lot of those kinds of band, really good guy. I interviewed him a couple of weeks ago. And he recommended a real good book that talks about all that. And I ordered it and I, I don't do much reading nowadays. I just don't have the time, but on, on a whim, it, it, something said, order that book. And along the lines of what we're talking about, I'm like, okay, you know, something's telling me to order the book, order the damn book, right? Um, it's called Soul Stories, and it talks about basically, you know, being receptive, which I try to be, but I really want to, I'm always trying to improve on it to your intuition. And it's just different stories of how, you know, like what you're talking about, like why did you go and busk for, you know, and it has stories that sometimes people like had a feeling of this or that or, you know, and, and of of that we really don't have as much control and you need to to pay attention to all these messages you're getting you know and i'm really into that man i'm really trying to be more open to all that stuff that's awesome yeah i think it's important i love that i think there's only an upside to it mm -hmm. i don't think there's any downside no exactly um let's talk about gear for a few minutes you've probably got a shit ton of good guitars man uh, what's your go-to guitar right now and what other two would round out your top three? Uh, my go-to guitar is my uh, signature model. Christmas. There you go. That's a beautiful guitar. Hold it a little higher. Okay. So the Corey Cherko signature model, it's like a, uh, is that hollow body or semi hollow body? Hollow. It's, hollow. It's, like, it's like a hollow. looks like, it looks like a 175. Right. Or, or a Les Paul or some, some hybrid combination for sure. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful blue guitar. The big is that a Bigsby? It is. Very cool, man. Talk about your guitar. Okay, well, it's got it's got one volume control because I love the Les Paul sort of thing, but I hate two volumes. <laughs> the only thing it's good for is when you want to do that, you know, toggle switch, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, but how often do you use that? Yeah. And the the thing that was tripping me up about two volumes is that I would. I'm like a pitcher. I'm just constantly twiddling these things, making sure they're up, making sure they're up, you know? Um, and you know, I'll have the, the bridge position volume down and then I'll go to, I'm playing a solo and I'm shredding. Oh yeah. It's so awesome. And then I'll, I want to go to my, my bridge or my uh, neck pickup and it's not, it's not on. Okay. I've done that so many times, you know, where the volume's down on one pickup or the other, you know, and obviously you can combine, the the two pickups but who does that and how often do you do it almost never yeah and and so i i, I put one volume on with two tones it's oh, like cool. a spat, which i think is a great configuration uh you know you can pinky the do volume swells with the pinky which is uh you know something that you couldn't do when the, the volumes are so much farther down on a les paul type thing uh now i can't do the momentary thing with the toggle switch anymore so i had a kill switch added ah there you go yeah so that that solves that problem um and then 
this is probably my favorite part. It's called it's called the Cory Churko Rebel. Why is it called the Rebel? Because you see that? Yeah. What is the that? Alliance logo. What is it? It's the Rebel Alliance logo from Star Wars. Oh, there you go. Uh, the, the Rebel <laughs> Alliance logo. Is that ebony or is that rosewood? It's rosewood. Yeah, it's pretty neck. Very dark. I like the. Yes. Yeah. So. Uh, you could whoever's you know if you're listening to this you could watch the video on youtube but it's a uh it's kind of like the way silverback guitars fade but except it's blue it's a yeah. it's like it's totally. like a royal blue almost what is that yeah and that was the biggest thing is like when i first they first asked me i said well it has to be like a sunburst blue like a blues burst i forget the the uh model that i'd seen of a gibson and i wanted it so badly just just for the color because i love the color and i said can you do that it's bird's eye maple beautiful guitar man we do all kinds of other exotic woods at prestige um but i wanted something that was sort of timeless and you know sometimes the styles of guitars come in and out like sometimes guitars are that are popular because they look like furniture and sometimes they're popular because they look like relics and you know i wanted something that was sort of timeless that would you know 20 years from now i'm not going to say oh i hate it because it looks like a piece of furniture you know, the wood's not beautiful. a real cool looking guitar, man. It's not over the top, you know, like, uh, you know, flame maple or something that might be a little more extreme or something. That's ah, a real cool look. That's going to be, that's, that would fit, man. If you looked at that 20 years ago, it would fit. If you looked at that 20 yeah. years from now, it's going to fit. Yeah. Time. I, I just wanted something that was timeless. That, uh, it has a lot more uh, access to the higher frets, uh, 22 frets. Um, you can see. Kind of the cutaway is a bit different than a Les Paul, so it's it, in the back of the neck. It doesn't have as much of a heel, so you can get up there a bit higher. Yeah, it's weird. It's like an ES. It's like a set one seventy five and a Les Paul combo, sort of. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's a good way to explain it. What are the what pickups are in there? Are those Prestige Zone? Um, no, they're Seymour Duncan's. Which ones? And I don't know the the name. <laughs> no, it's all good, man. When we went through it, I. I you know, I just kind of went on the Seymour Duncan website and listened to all the different examples that they have because there's tons. And I just said, I like this and this, put that in there. Because um, after that point, I really didn't have any favorite favorite pickups aside from my my Les Paul, which was just the stock. Uh, what do they call them? Burst puckers? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I said I wanted it to sound like that. And, and it, it's as close as, as you can get. Um, what else can I say about it? You can get get yours. Yeah, man. Where do you prestige guitars dot com? Prestige guitar, I think, right? Uh, guitars. Guitar, guitars. Prestige yeah. guitars. Yeah. Um, what's number two and number three for you? Oh uh, yeah. So the other one is um. Dude, your studio is packed, man. <laughs> it's my telly. Hang on, my I just pulled my cable out. Here we go. I'll be back. There you go. So it's my uh, thin line telly. Very cool. So do you do you tend to like? Wow, that is a beautiful uh, fretboard and neck. Wow, man, that's a really pretty guitar. I got this. Oh, you got Perloid. Exactly. I got it on the first Shania tour, and I just use it ever since for for country stuff. You know, it's, I use it on on a couple of Kelly tours as well for certain sounds. And are you big on semi hollow and hollow body guitars, or all your guitars like F old or? Not, not really. I've got probably the an equal amount, yeah. um, and then and then I have to say that probably this this Les Paul is probably my other go to in this. Oh, that's a pretty good. So that's like the well, I've never seen. That's all red. That's like the the red color version of your blue guitar almost. Yeah, and this is flame. It's that's what is what color is that's not like high and red. And I what got it, it. I got it at the beginning of the 2000s. So it's probably like a late 90s Les Paul. That's a pretty guitar, man. It it's yeah. real pretty. It's it's probably my best sounding guitar, if I'm gonna be honest. Yeah. As far as well, you know, for for crunch rock, I have yeah. to, you know, obviously for country stuff, I I would never use it, except for modern country, which everybody's got either a PRS or a Les Paul these days. Yes, it's very very accurate. It's yeah. a really pretty guitar, man. I like that. Yeah. Is that, yeah. is, that a, is that Rosewood also or Ebony? That one's Rosewood as well. Yeah. yeah so, is, so is the Telly. Yeah. It, it looks really nice guitars, man. I like that. Thanks. And I've seen a bunch of videos that you play in your 
prestige. It sounds great, man. Right. Yeah, I, I love it. It just it plays like butter, and um, it you know they they were willing to do anything that I asked, so I just put it out there, and and uh, it's something that I'll I'll be happy with for a long time. What are you playing through typically? Uh, right now, um, I have ditched all my real amps for uh, Kemper and Helix combination mm. right now. Um, I was sold on the whole Kemper technology when I profiled my own amps and AB'd them. <laughs> oh, and you couldn't tell the difference. And, you know, if you really listen, there was a difference, but it wasn't like, oh, well, this is better. It, it was just slightly different. In fact, the, uh, the Kemper seemed, I don't know what their technology is, but it seemed to have more punch. Almost like there was a loudness maximizer that, you know, how, and, and the amps sounded a little more spongy, I suppose. What, what were your amps that you were modeling? I was always a, a Bogner user. Hmm. I had a Bogner Ecstasy. Uh, I used Marshall on tours. I used uh, Matchless on tours. Um, so some really good amps. Yeah. And, and I, I've modeled them all. I still have all those amps in my camper. <laughs> That's it's wild, crazy, man. Crazy what uh, what the the technology is these days, and the best thing about it, um, you know, I started I started with the technology because you know when you do fly dates or TV shows, you can't bring all your gear with you. So Hell no. What are you gonna do? You're gonna backline. Well, every time you backline and rent something in the city you're at, the tubes are not good, the speakers are blown, or it's just a bad model, you know. So uh, I just found it a consistency to be way better in the digital world. That's cool. You, know, you practice at home with the sound. You go play the gig. You have the exact same sound. There's no surprises. I'm the kind of guy that gets thrown off if there's an issue. Like if if the guitar doesn't sound right, if there's a short in my chord, it, I'll, it'll just throw off my playing completely. Like I, I, I can't get through that so easily. Cause I'm, I'm, Are you OCD? I'm, yeah, probably. I'm trying to troubleshoot. Well, it could be this. Oh, I just forgot to come in there, you know. Right, right. Yeah. So this has eliminated all that. This stuff just works. That's cool, man. Good for you. I think a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm hearing more and more people moving over to that. So, yeah. you know. Yeah, totally. Who Favorite players you've enjoyed jamming with? Favorite players? Well, Todd Kearns. <laughs> Shane Gallas. <laughs> um, favorite? Do you, do you play with non-Canadian players? Do I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just busting on you, man. Um, you know, on the last Shanai tour, we would jam on the bus after the gigs Yeah. and the musicians that I, that were on that tour, it was, this is 2015 tour were like the best. We had Jason Maori, who is a Nashville dude. He's, uh, primarily a fiddle player, but a utility guy as well. Um, knows his bluegrass up, up and down. That's um, such difficult music, man. Totally. And, and so we, he would sing and. Um, and the other guitar player in the Schneider band, Josh Gooch, who is an unbelievable musician. Um, in fact, you should have him on the show because he did everything guitar. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what, this is now the, I just got referred to him, but this is now like the fourth time I've heard his name. So right. I'm, I, I'm in, in my spirit of listening to the universe. Now I got to call him. Yeah. He, he's in his, his woodshedding years. Like he, he's still in his twenties. Um, so everything is like all about his craft right now. Yeah. And it's really, it's really fun to see. He's, he's, he's a, an insane improviser, which I've never been great at. I've, I've always been a parts kind of guy where I'll come up with a solo. I'll listen to it two days later. If I don't like it, I'll tweak it a bit and I'll just get the right combination of notes. Then people can hear it. <laughs> right. Okay. Hey, works for Gilmore. There's nothing wrong with that. Totally. Gilmore, Brian May. I, I'm, I'm totally, and those are two of my favorite guitar players, needless to say. Yeah. Um, but Josh is like, I don't care. I'll, I'll play a freaking, I'll play a, a lap steel, even if I haven't played it before and, and just make it work, you know, and play it in front of everybody. Uh, he's, he just, he's fearless and he's not scared of playing the wrong note. Uh, and he rarely plays the wrong note. Yeah, that's cool. So it was really fun to be around that, those kinds of people you know, even on the bus, just to, just to learn from, I mean, you, you just always are learning from people. Yeah. Uh, first, 
first record you ever purchased? <laughs> Somebody asked me that a while back. And because I grew up in a musical family, it wasn't like my first record ever. Here it is. I can't remember. I honestly cannot remember. Yeah, you probably had so much music around. My dad had yeah. such a big record collection that, you know, it wasn't such a big deal when I added my own record to that collection. Yeah, I get it. Um, Are your folks still around? Yeah. Yep. They live up Moose Jaw. Both of them are still up in Moose Jaw. That's great. Yeah. You get up there, you get up there much? Um, or do they come down and see you? or? I'm actually going in a couple of days to surprise my niece for her graduation. Oh, dude, that's really cool, man. Congratulations. That's nice, man. And I know that this is coming out after that point, so it's not going to spoil it. Yeah, yeah. Totally cool, man. That's really great. But yeah, my mom still plays bass. Uh, uh, she has like a bunch of different bands. She's probably busy. She has more gigs than I have. <laughs> And, and my dad's still teaching music and um, he plays the odd thing here and there, but that's cool, man. That's really good. Desert Island discs. Top three. You said one was uh highway and highways and heartaches. Yeah. Ricky Skaggs. Um, I would have to say, of course, Queen Bohemian Rhapsody. I wore that, that record out as a kid. There's, and if, and it's so much more, uh, did I say Bohemian Rhapsody? It's a night of the opera. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. There's so much more than Bohemian Rhapsody on that record. Um, that, you know, that obviously is a great song, but there's a lot of other songs like that that are just as epic. The Prophet's, Prophet's, song, uh, Prophet's song is amazing. Um, you know what? And I think Jesus Christ Superstar is, is one of my Desert Island records. Interesting. The Broadway soundtrack? Yeah, but there's so many different versions. It yeah. has to be the right one, but, you know, with Ted Neely and Carl Anderson as, as Judas. Uh, you know, that was, a, and I'm not really big on musicals, but, but that really had a big impact on me as a kid. And the songs are, are, you know, so melodic and the performances were so amazing. You know, it was, it was like rock guys singing a musical, which yeah. is very rare. Totally. It was a, it's funny you mentioned my, my wife's from the UK and her mom or her mom who's 85 wrote, she goes, I want you to have Brian May on your show. I wrote him a letter. <laughs> great. He probably would do it based on that. Uh, I said, all right, mom, I hope it gets through. <laughs> oh yeah. I bet you have him on your show. That would be so funny, man. I got this letter from your mom. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's such a mom thing to do. Yeah. Oh, she's sweet. Is, um, is it mother-in-law because you were talking with an English accent? It's my mother-in-law. Yeah, it's my wife's mother. Yeah. My wife's mom. Yeah. So she's over there. Uh, that's still awesome good for her yeah yeah and i think if i was to 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 also you know one of my favorite albums is the radiohead okay computer oh that's a great album man did you see what happened today um did you see that thing on facebook apparently somebody hacked basically archived music that tom york had uh -oh. and he said if you don't pay me one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, like i don't know how these idiots come up like why not a hundred thousand or 200 no if you don't pay or 151 if you don't pay me one hundred fifty thousand dollars, i'm going to release this into the public and he said hey man no worries we're going to release it to the public so they just released like 18 oh uh one hour plus re archive recordings and the band said look they're archived for a reason they're not stuff we'd release we don't think it's that good but it's on Bandcamp, i think now or soundcloud one of the two just happened today wow. no kidding yeah well, that seems like exactly something they do you know yeah why well, some such a douchey thing to do like to steal someone's music and say it's like to steal a car or something you know i mean like just I don't get that stuff. Every time I put something on Craigslist, I get some kind of scammer, you know. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, everything. Yeah, it's, why do people do this kind of stuff? I don't know. Some people, I think a lot of people are just wired that way, like because a lot of them, you've got to put a lot of work into that. And if you took that same work and did it, it's just some people are just wired. They're not capable. And I've met people like that. They're just not capable of, you know, yeah. taking this road. They got to go on the the squirrely road. I don't know. Yeah, sure, it's too bad. Best decision you've ever made, Corey marrying my wife good man hands down it's nice to hear man i hear that a lot with musicians definition of happiness um i don't think true happiness is achievable 
to be honest. Interesting. Good. No, I've heard stuff like this before. I think you can be content. I think you can feel joy. I think you can have moments of happiness. But this world is just kind of wired so that, you know, even in your happiness, there's something to worry about. And mm. if there's worry, there's a bit of suffering. And suffering is the antithesis of happiness. I hear you. And I heard somebody say once that ha happiness, only time happiness is achievable in this plane or this world is just as you're about to fall asleep. <laughs> you feel slightly conscious, you know, because even in your dreams, you can be suffering, right? Yeah, yeah. Or you just, you just, you just let go. I've heard stuff like that. You're I not think, alone. I think love and happiness are synonymous. You know, certainly the most happy times in my life were the times when, when I was so, you know, dating my wife and we were so in love and, you know, everything would, didn't matter what else happened. Everything felt, felt good. Man, it's funny. I, I, the best, the best time in my life was falling in love with my wife, hands down. I would never have that experience again. And I still feel very close to her, but that period, it was like magic, man. I didn't think it, it was like walking on clouds. So I, I, I feel that way. Nothing like it. What do you like most about yourself? Tough question. Yeah. It's, um, <laughs> It's the question no one really wants to face or or look at because because you're you, there's always something that's wrong with what you're doing or what you're saying. Or who you well, that'll be the next question. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, that'll be the next question. What do you want to change most? I I think I think what I like most about myself is that it, it takes very little to keep me happy. Uh, I can I can do with the bare minimum and you know put a put a pair of running shoes on me and put me in in nature you know and i'm completely happy well not completely happy as i said in my last can't day. be completely happy unless you're falling asleep yeah, very content um and i can i can find interest in just about anything do you have interest outside of music uh well yeah i've got a ton of interest i've always been sort of a, a bit of a health nut i've been vegan for 13 years so i'm pretty oh, cool outspoken on that kind of stuff. Um, I almost consider myself pseudo activist now in veganism. I, for, for the longest time, I was like, you know, everybody makes their own decisions and that sort of thing. And, and to me, it was a bit of an experiment. Can I be healthy? Can I be have longevity on a vegan diet? And now, you know, after 13 years, I've proven that. Is your wife vegan also? Yeah, she is. I would think it'd be hard to be in a relationship where one of you are vegan and the other one's not. Yeah, there would definitely be tension. Yeah. That's like, you know what the thing, this is a new criteria, like social media. Yeah. Like if my wife was one of these people who was on Facebook 24 seven, that would fucking drive me nuts. I, I would have a hard time and like, oh, here's us doing this and here's us doing that. And I'm like, man, cause I'm like, I like talking to people, but I like my time is my private time. I don't feel compelled to, oh, here's my fucking fish tacos and here's my margarita that I'm having for the, yeah, I, that's not me. I'm not. Yeah. So I, I, and I see people online that are like out of the, con, like 24 seven on it and it would freak right. me out. Yeah. My wife doesn't have any social media account at all. Yeah. Uh, she does peruse mine though. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no. Uh, yeah. Okay. So now tell me the other side if you could change one thing about yourself, what would it be? Um, I'm a pretty good pro procrastinator. Really? Yeah, I can, I can sit, set aside things for later fairly easily. I like, I like to take the path of least resistance in my life. That's and, good. Yeah. And I, you know, we talked about stress already. I don't like to be stressed. And so, I'll try to make decisions where I won't be stressed. And if that means working less, I'll do that. That's a great thing though, man. I think quality of life is, is, you know, and all my friends are such overachievers and, you know, and, and part of me feels like I'm missing out if I don't do what they do. But um, ultimately, you know, I'm not happy doing that. So I, I sort of stay away from being that, that overachiever type of person and, I take time for myself. I go hiking and, and I play hockey and 
I play video games when I want to. And That's good, man. I give you credit for that. I wish I could do that more. And cuddle with my dogs, my wife. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anything you wish you did differently? I don't think so. I think, like I said, I don't think you can do anything differently. It's, it's, I, I'm a big believer in destiny and lack of free will. And we're just, we're just all actors on a stage and, you know, mine is a musician in this one and somebody else might wish they were a musician doing what I'm doing, but you know, they, they probably have a lot of other things that, that are equally as cool about their life. And last question, biggest change. And ben, I tell you what you need to come up. I got to tell everybody if, if you're just listening, not watching this Corey Cherko looks like about 20 years younger than he is. So I'm thinking you should come up with an anti-aging skin cream for rock, rock, rock and rollers who want to stay young, dude. Yeah, I, I think rock and roll keeps you young. I think my vegan diet keeps me young. I think, uh, Exercise enough, keeps you young too. Yeah. Young. Getting enough sleep keeps me young. Yeah, you um, get. Are you good with sleeping? How often do you, do you sleep? Eight hours, or I always get eight hours. Do you really? I mean, when I was doing wow. the mix with though, we were doing like three, four hours a night of sleep. It was so intense, and that's why I said I don't. I don't think I'd ever want to do that again. But I'm so glad that I did it. Yeah, I totally get it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, he doesn't seem to be. I don't think you could operate and do as much as he's done. Right. That's not congruent with the same guy that says, Hey, um, you know, five o'clock guys, I need to, I mean, we need to call it in for the day. I need to get my eight hours. That's just not congruent, you know, yeah. to perform at such a high level. So consistently off so much. Yeah. Last question, Corey, biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of that was in is intentional and how much has just been a part of aging? Um, well, I'm definitely a lot grouchier. Really? <laughs> <laughs> These kids and their music, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm one of those guys who gets mad at people's actions in the world and like, why can't that guy see? And why did he do stuff like that? And, you know, can't, can't he see if he just did it this way? And, you know, I have the answer for everything. But um, so you know, when I have all these, all these philosophical thoughts, I, I don't always listen to my own. Yeah. It's, it's easy to get off on a tangent. It's easy to get, you know, road rage and living in LA it certainly happens, can happen quite often. Um, and I just have to keep reminding myself that, you know, same thing that we're all on a journey. We're all have our destiny and, and everybody's not wired the same. Yeah. It's always hard for me to, to remember that because I get caught up in, everything that everybody else does. And, and um, it's hard to, to be compassionate and find love for my fellow human being because I can certainly find all the reasons. Why oh, it's easy to find. Yeah, yeah, sure. I get that. Yeah. But uh, I know it's not the right way to think. You know? yeah, no, it's not. Uh, just it's not go away, not for them, for you. Exactly. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, I used to get frustrated like that, like, you know, and not, I guess it's judging, but just having expectations, raising kids taught me never to have expectations. Not that my kids have like disappointed me. Uh, it's just that you never, you see how people like I, my, one of my kids may do something and my wife and I'll be like, where did they get that from? I don't do that. You don't do that. It's not a bad or a good thing. It's just like something totally different. Like, you know, maybe a food they eat or a behavior they have. It's just, and so I learned never to have expectations and I was able to, and I'm still working on it, apply that to the rest of the world of it's not my business, you yeah. know, and it just, and, but I did it for selfish reasons because it, it takes, I don't have to deal with stress if I get rid of that. No. Yeah. I love, I love what you just said. It's very, it's very Buddhist actually. And there's a Buddhist saying that, uh, no expectations, no disappointments. Yeah. You know, it's not, and it's, it's not my business and I'm not going to, why would I vest in something that could potentially get me stressed? That's not even my business, no. you know? And especially once your kids get older, you see them doing stuff and, uh, you know, Mark's like, Oh, I'm going to talk to Nick. I'm like, babe, that's not your business. You know, you have no right. Imagine him talking to you. He didn't like how you behave. You'd be like, you know, 
I said, you, you just, you know, if he, if he wants to talk, you know, just be there. But, you know, so of course, like, it's easy for me to say that, but, you know, but uh, I tried to really do that. But again, it's selfish motivated. I just don't want the stress. I, I really am firm, like, to try to minimize my own stress. So. Life's too slow to be stressed. What's that? Yeah, it just really is. And it, and it does, that does age you. And it makes your life a lot shorter to be stressed. <laughs> That's right. Dude, let me uh, tell people where to find you. It's Corey Cherko. And thanks for everything, man. I really appreciate you being so open and cool. And I really enjoyed all your stories, man. And you deserve all the success you have because I know how talented you are. Every, so many people have talked to me about you. So um, I appreciate that. Thanks, Craig. Tuke, T-O-Q-U-E. The last record was Giver. The new record is called, it's coming out in a couple of months, in August. It is called, I'm sorry, let me write, I wrote the name down, the single, Never Enough. And I'd love to hear it on the show, man, if you'd like. Um, so check out, does Tuke have a website? Yep, tukerocks.ca. Great. So Tuke Rocks, let me spell that, T-O-Q-U-E rocks.ca for Canada. So check out all their music on there. You could also stream Tuke anywhere music is streamed. If you are interested in connecting with Corey to have him do some engineering, mixing, or working with you and playing tracks, you could hit him up either on Facebook or Instagram. Excuse me. And um, for session work. And check out at Prestige Guitars, the Corey Cherko model guitar. It's a badass looking guitar. Dude, anything else that I missed or any final words? No, I think that's it, man. We had a good talk. Thank you, man. I appreciate everything. Thanks so much for your time. Everybody, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Please support Corey Cherko and his music. Come out and see uh, Shania. When is she starting up again? Uh, it's going to be announced any day, um, but you will see something from her by the end of the year. Awesome. And you are going to be touring with Slash, taking Frank Sidoris's place. I know you guys are coming to Orlando, man. Has that been extended anywhere? Like Any chances you're coming to Tampa? That's a good question. I don't know that. I'm going to look right after this call. Uh, anyway, go see Slash on the road, and uh, you'll see Corey. Make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter list so you and I can connect. And most important, close your ears on this one. Remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. <laughs> uh, be nice. Go play your guitar and have fun. Until next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. Bye.